Great. And so now as we move to our last major presentation of the Virtual Patient Symposium, um, for those of you sort of sticking in with us, thank you so much. But this is going to be a big panel discussion. What did I learn from kidney cancer? Um, you know, we always think about what can you go back and tell your younger self? And so these are people who at different stages, different diagnoses can offer some insight, but we definitely welcome people to put their comments, their insights um, as well into the chat, questions for these people who may be at different stages than what you're at. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Salima Witt, who's gonna be moderating the session. Um, and she has a great panel to talk today. So I'm gonna turn it over to her. Hi, Sally. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, my name is Salima Witt. I'll be your moderator today. We have an amazing panel. We have Megan Conley, Richie Johnson, Peggy Zuckerman, and they're all going to give us their insight and their knowledge of what they've learned um, from kidney cancer. So without further ado, I think um, if you guys could introduce yourselves, maybe we'll start with Megan and um, you can give us um, your insight. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone, or, or good morning, depending on, on where you are in, in, the, in the world, um, or good evening, I should say, too. Um, <clears throat> my name is Megan Conley, and uh, I was incidentally diagnosed with chromophobe renal cell carcinoma at 34 years old in 2020. Um, the diagnosis came during a series of ultrasounds and scans for fertility issues um, I had been having. And uh, obviously uh, our plan of, of trying to start a family quickly shifted from that to figuring out um, how we were going to uh, treat the cancer. So, um, you know, seeing some of the questions that have come in from uh, those that are registered for this event, you know, I, I went during my whole cancer journey, you know, I went through a misdiagnosis, I went through um, a, a difference of an opinion between doctors, uh, getting a second opinion, um, and, and complications, and, and also COVID uh, during all of this. So I know we're going to get into it more during our, our discussion. Um, but there's certainly many things I can speak to, but one of them that I think is really important is just remembering that you really are your own health advocate. And, and it's very important to challenge your doctor, ask questions, um, and, and don't be afraid to, to get a second opinion. You know, at the time of my diagnosis, I was young and healthy and asymptomatic. And really there was no reason to suspect that it was cancer. Um, and initially they thought it was a, a benign mass of the kidney called an angiomyelopoma. Um, and at the time I probably would have accepted that as an, as an answer, but since we were trying to get pregnant and, and start a family, I was concerned at of the potential growth of the mass during pregnancy with hormones. Um, and I was concerned of a risk of it rupturing. That's not something I wanted to deal with during, during pregnancy. Um, so I, I did a little bit of research and I decided to go see a, a urologist. And um, that's when kind of the different phases of my diagnosis started. It went from a, a benign mass to a possible cyst to various types of cancer based on the imaging report. And then finally um, to a biopsy where they determined exactly what it was. Um, but get, to get to that biopsy part, I needed to get a second opinion. Um, you know, I had a doctor that said, don't worry, don't get a biopsy. There's a risk of getting a false negative. Um, you don't need it. Let's just get in there and, and perform surgery. And the next doctor said, no, 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 we, we want a biopsy. We want a biopsy number one, because there's a 10% chance that you could have a, a fat poor angiomyelopoma, which is commonly misdiagnosed as cancer based on imaging alone. The other side of it is we want to know what kind of cancer we're dealing with, because that may change my approach on whether I'm going to attempt a partial or radical nephrectomy um, to, to uh, you know, reduce any risk of exposure in other areas of my body. Um, so I'm a really big believer on empowering patients to, to really be their own champions. And, and that, you know, takes support from family 
It takes support from organizations like the Kidney Cancer Association and others um, to really help educate yourselves and um, don't, be, don't be afraid or, or intimidated of, of the process. You know, when you were going through the stages of biopsy, no biopsy, what was it that made you decide your your choice? What what what, what can you tell people that you said, you know, um, be your own advocate? What was that part for you that made you choose? Like, well, give some insight if you can on that. You know, it, it's hard because as soon as you get the diagnosis, you immediately want the cancer out and you want it out as quickly as you can get it out. And sometimes getting a second opinion, it, it takes time. I mean, I had to wait almost a month to get a second opinion and that's a really long month. But at the same time, my gut, I just didn't have a good feeling. And I think, you know, you know your body best and you really just listen to what it's telling you to do. Um, and that's really, you know, why I, I decided to get a second opinion and speaking to, you know, people that, that I surround myself with, you know, especially my husband, he was like, this, this is crazy. You know, you get second opinions in life for things like buying a car or work around your house, and you're not going to do this for your health. And, you know, we're all guilty of doing it, but you, you'd never feel obligated to stay with the doctor that gave you the diagnosis in the room. That's a huge takeaway that you oh just really listened to that gut and said, no, I, I have to wait this month out. I have to go, go do this. This is not sitting well with me. That's an amazing, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I think we'll go ahead and move to uh, Richie. Are you up for uh, your turn? <laughs> Let's see. Good Let's morning. Uh, I am so excited to be here. Um, I am a registered nurse by profession and an active member of the KCA Patient and Caregiver Advisory Council, as well as president and founder of the Chris C.J. Johnson Foundation. My journey started uh, with kidney cancer in June of 2011. My son at the time was uh, 38 years old. He had gone to several physicians trying to find out why his back was hurting so bad. He, had got, they were, he was referred to a chiropractor. He was referred for physical therapy. Not one time did anyone do a CT scan or MRI to see what else was going on. So it was in June of 2011 when he was at work and he had um, noticed blood in his urine. And as a nurse, I said, well, let's go to the closest emergency room. And of course, we came back to Sugarland to go to the emergency room. And that's when... They found a tumor suspicious for cancer. It was already seven centimeters. Um, of course, hearing the word cancer, you know, was devastating to us. We were in shock, um, not knowing what to do next. Now, I have spent over 40 years at the time taking care of other patients, not knowing now as a caregiver, here it is, my son, he has been diagnosed with cancer, not knowing what kind of cancer. And of course, um, I'm now searching for answers, uh, knowing that I needed to keep myself together in order to be uh, a support person for him. It's totally different when it's a loved one versus when you're taking care of someone you really don't know. Even though you have the passion, um, it's still different. Ultimately, he had his kidney removed. We still, it was another week or so before we knew um, what type of cancer it was. And then when I found out it was renal medullary carcinoma, which is extremely rare, uh, an aggressive form of kidney cancer that tend to affect individuals with sickle cell trait, I was dumbfounded. I went to nursing school. I was always told that um, sickle cell trait is benign. I too am a carrier. You will live a healthy life. Never in my wildest dreams would I have known that REMC could be a factor if you have sickle cell trait. And I didn't say disease, I said sickle cell trait. So then our next step was trying to get uh, into MD Anderson, the barriers that we face, even though he had health insurance, 
The case manager with the health insurance had labeled him as a pre having a pre existing condition. So therefore, MD Anderson did not want to take him, uh, admit him to the hospital because it was pre existing and the insurance said they would not pay for his care. So here's another barrier that, that we're going through. If it hadn't been for Dr. Tanier, who said, I want to see this young man, and basically being an advocate for us, saying, you need to worry about insurance later. This young man is in excruciating pain and needs to be treated. So those are barriers, along with <clears throat> the insurance company still not paying bills up to half a million dollars. So here we're trying to focus on <clears throat> the cancer itself, I'm trying to provide support to my son. I'm trying to keep all this away from him because I didn't want to stress him out. Um, was just, it was devastating. It was, it was just so painful. And then he <clears throat> going through the treatment remained so strong. Um, he wanted to fight for others. And it was because of him that we started the foundation because this journey was extremely lonely. There were no support groups. Every little bit of information that we found on the internet was just devastating. Uh, even though we had family, church support, it's not the same when you have someone that has actually gone through this process. So it's so important to be an advocate as, as Megan talked about, you have to be an advocate for your loved one because oftentimes they're not in the position to help themselves. Uh, this cancer was diagnosed at stage four. It had already spread it to his spinal cord, his pelvic region. Um, and I think that, that was the main thing at the time. Had he not been so healthy, he was given initially three to four months to live and he lived 15 months. We actually thought we had beat this thing after a year, um, but he remained positive. Um, and as his mother, I supported him throughout. I resigned from my position as a nurse and so that I could adequately take care of him. So not knowing all of this when you're into it, it it's, it's really devastating, it hits you emotionally, it hits you financially. Um, just hearing the word cancer is just so, so devastating. So support is extremely important to anyone that's going through uh, the cancer diagnosis. And I thank you. I think it is, it's, do you feel, um, Richie, the currently now compared to when you were going through this in 2011, there's more support in the community, in the kidney cancer community that you're able to reach out now virtually because of COVID, but that, that you had back at the beginning, it's almost like you were a pioneer. Exactly. Um, I, I, I have to say that I had reached out to other cancer organizations not knowing where to start, and they weren't really receptive to talking about renal medullary carcinoma. They said, well, you need to go to a sickle cell disease organization. And I wasn't getting anything from them because they said, oh, we just deal with the disease. We don't deal with the trait. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just so grateful. I know when Gretchen came on with the Kidney Cancer Association, we had started doing some things with KCA, but it's nothing to, the, to where it is today. And we're just excited that KCA support us, um, work with the Chris C.J. Johnson Foundation to get this word out to others. Um, you before wanna... now, we didn't oh, have it. A little bit into your foundation. Can you share with us about it a little bit more, what you're doing currently? Oh, and, right. And oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, the Chris C.J. Johnson Foundation was formed in April of 2013. We are a nun a uh, profit, uh, non-tax-exempt uh, organization. Um, we provide support to the REMC committee, community. Uh, we uh, have an REMC support group now. We're the only ones with the support group um, for our community. And even though our community is small, we are worldwide. We're over in uh, the UK. We're over in uh, Greece, Colombia. Um, just being a beacon of light for people that are going through 
REMC has been instrumental through our foundation. Chris's legacy lived through the foundation. It was because of him that I even thought about starting the foundation. He felt that advocacy was so important because there was no information out there regarding kidney cancer and REMC was unheard of. And so it was because of his inspiration that I started the foundation. Um, so we're here uh, 24 seven offering support to the REMC community. And every year we have our Keeping It Renal uh, Run Walk, and this is our way of uh, raising funds. We have donated to MD Anderson for the past, I would say six years, uh, just to enhance REMC research. And it's because of our advocacy that Dr. Tanir um, and Dr. Masal have really vested an interest into doing more uh, with REMC because we were told initially, well, it only affect one person here and there. You know, I said, but if that one person was your child, you would think differently. And I just want to share the words that Chris had said when he was in ICU. Dr. Janir came in um, to tell him that there was nothing else he could do for him. So Chris raised up on that bed with a, a firm voice and he said, you know, you're world renowned. You're MD Anderson. I need you to save me so that I can see my six year old daughter graduate from high school. It was those words that ignited the REMC movement. And it's because of that, that we are where we are today with clinical trials and people are living longer because of the research and the advocacy that's out there now. Oh, gee, thank you so, so very much for sharing that. Um, website, do you have one? Yes, it's chrisjohnsonfoundation.org. Thank you, thank, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I will ask you some more questions later, but I wanna get on to Peggy Suckerman, thank you. And by the way, isn't that why we're all here? If we touch the lives of one person, if we could help one person, it doesn't matter how big or small the group is. We're here to share and to help. Exactly. So that, Peggy, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you again, Richie. And hey. Well, thank you. And thank you, obviously, to the KCA and all the work that they've done laying foundations for years prior to our being in this uh, symposium and, uh, and for the countless people who have reached out to the KCA and to the researchers and to the related work as Richie's done. Uh, this is, it's improving, I think, and as I have looked at what I would say today and so on, I think that's the biggest and first message. It's improved dramatically, but there's a lot more to go and we will be successful. And I, I, I see the glimmerings of that, that I would not have felt comfortable to, to really say even five years ago. And I am, uh, I'm a success story, frankly, after an early disaster story. I was in uh, 2004, I'd been misdiagnosed with as if I'd had a tiny stomach ulcer and then the, for it to kind of uh, have caused a severe anemia. And behind that stomach ulcer diagnosis was frankly the thought that I was just a fussy menopausal woman, not, uh, not taking care of myself, which might've been true, but I'd been healthy, so who, who needed to? And that misdiagnosis continued as my labs and everything fell apart, but the doctor decided I simply had to be an alcoholic to account for the drop off in, in my health, my blood labs, liver labs. And so finally, after working eight months with a doctor who was supposedly watching me in a good hospital and with all, and frankly, I had resources to go wherever I wanted to go. And I had a background of being an advocate for education, spoke on the state level, the PTA ladies were at my house every other day, that kind of background. And yet I had not been uh, comfortable, nor did I know how to even say to this doctor after eight months, what else could this be? 
and with that, let myself, you know, get sicker and sicker until the uh, need arose to, to confirm my cirrhosis with a liver biopsy, and that required a small ultrasound in less than 60 seconds of washing that ultrasound wand across my belly. It was the uh, technician turned the screen away so I couldn't see, but I then knew that I had a mass on my right kidney. And then it becomes, you know, a quick hideous blur. I knew I had something that mass equaled to me instantly, cancer, a CT scan, and the longest about eight hours before my doctor finally called me because of course, as a patient, they won't tell you anything at that point. And even then the doctor said, well, you have a mass and in the morning I'll get, I'll find someone for you to talk to. So not only ignorant about what had happened and why, and I hadn't the brains to ask how large this mass was. It seemed inconceivable. Could it be anything more than the size of a pea or a peanut? And I felt generally healthy until I started, you know, the last three months months perhaps just started looking pretty bad, losing weight and still not getting anywhere with a real diagnosis. So with that, and I always say I was lucky I was born in North Dakota and up there, I remind myself, my North Dakota background taught me that growing up in this tiny rural town, very much like some of the rural areas that are all over this country, there was no doctor. There certainly was no specialist as I grew up. And uh, so I went to the Mayo Clinic, which was kind of the regional response. One might make Denver or uh, Mayo Clinic, and they were about 800 miles apart. So I was able to get myself referred there, found out that the testing I'd had, including the CAT scan, and the talk with the doctor had not given me the information I needed that this mass was uh, 10 centimeters, about the size of a softball or four inches, you know, this big, there on my kidney. Doctor indicated that it was something that could have been felt had I had a decent physical exam. And moreover, that the uh, CT had shown that I had metastases in the lower portion of my lungs confirmed to be throughout my lungs. So in my head, in those few days, I went from this pesky ulcer that wasn't healing up to a mass on my kidney to a huge mass on my kidney to metastases. And uh, by that time, you know, gotten on the internet, knew how to read, write, and oh, turn on the computer, and knew I was in, in trouble because it was a rare disease. And only then, however, did I find out at that time, and again, this is 2004, that there was but one treatment beyond surgery. And that was uh, an immune therapy, but that was really devastating to find out. And this is how I look at Richie's foundation and her son and think, my gosh, that sounds so terribly familiar, something so dramatic in a healthy person. And, and then to find we know so little. And so I, I like to hope that the experience I had, which is pretty typical of clear cell kidney cancer patients, the most common version, might be a model for those rare cancers. And it was, um, I did go through what's called high dose interleukin, a general immune therapy booster, I said, revved up my system, uh, which saved my life. It, it was a grueling treatment. Some have said brutal. I can't remember much, so I don't think it was brutal. My kids, my family still do not want to really talk to me about it. So it was grown kids who knew mom was at risk to dying. And frankly, had I not been responsive uh, and I've had a complete and durable response now for these 17 years, I would have likely lived about that many months. My goal was as uh, Richie's son, Chris wanted just to see your child graduate from high school. My youngest son was still at home and I thought I have to see him graduate and perhaps help him pack for college. That was all I could hope for. 
And that was a pretty reasonable hope at the time. And so to have done so well and, and then come to understand how, how very lucky I was, more than I even realized at that time, turned me into a, a kidney cancer patient advocate with a lot of emphasis on what's happening in the research. I'm an ex-school teacher and a mom, and so I have to I have to lecture people <laughs> endlessly and with some enthusiasm too often. But it was uh, you know, these these shifts also in me that this doesn't have to be this way. Richie feels the same, you know, I have to do something about it. And so part of my advocacy beyond, first of all, taking care of myself well enough that I could uh, get through the treatments and uh, search out what support group I could have uh, became a, the start of a larger advocacy. So I'll sort of jump forward. So now in the last number of years, I have been involved in individual support groups, online support groups, started and kept one going for a while at a hospital and uh, gone to kidney cancer association programs. In fact, I think back to the very first one I was long before I was well, we sat through in a, in a hospital auditorium, a group of about 60 patients, you know, glad to know there were more than just the single one of us. I think we all felt very alone at that time. And the grand finale lecture was from a kidney cancer doctor who gave a lecture that was about one of the early targeted age, uh, agents. When that lecture was over and the lady had been thanked and, you know, sent out of the room and we were all there as a kind of an informal group now, somebody said from up front, did anybody understand any of that? And everybody kind of laughed nervously because none of us had. We'd not had the guts <laughs> to say, can you tell me what that really means? And that again became an example of out of that group then came one of the first support groups. And I, again, back to the school teacher said, after about three, four months, I thought I could have helped translate that lecture for that doctor so it would be understandable to patients. And so that's been kind of the goal. And so as it is now, I, have, uh, I also work as, the, um, as a volunteer in all this, as the SWOG, that's one of the clinical trial networks, I work as the renal patient research advocate. And we have, as advocates, been able to shape trials and help the doctors and researchers understand what's important to patients so that the patients can find the trials, understand the trials. An example of back to my ignorance, I did go through a trial before I hit my successful treatment. And I thought I was being offered the one and only kidney cancer trial in all of America. I had no idea that there was more than one. And again, I hope, <laughs> I mean, I think I'm sort of smart in the rest of my life, but I was really so stupid about medical care, about kidney cancer, about clinical trials, that uh, if anybody is equally, <laughs> feeling equally stupid out there, you've got good company because we've well, all had to <laughs> come a long way. But um, so with that, I will come back to you, Salim and the others and say what, well, you know, questions. it's really interesting because really as patients or, you know, we jump into this cancer world and how would we know there's one trial, a hundred trials, 50 trials, different type. I mean, I don't think that's chalked up to stupidity. That's just to show how huge and encompassing this whole uh, cancer, kidney cancer world is. I mean, you found out later on <laughs> that wasn't so, but... How would you know? It's, I mean, you're diving into this world of the unknown and it's really incredible. And, and I think shocking, it was isolating to me. Mm -hmm. And again, I think with Richie's family situation, even more so with a more rare cancer, I again did not know that there was more than one kind of kidney cancer. That was bad enough is how I looked at it. Mm -hmm. And as I got more knowledgeable, 
I started also reaching out to like rare cancer organizations and rare disease organizations, because this is a problem which is reflected across disease groups and, uh, and happily, you know, the internet, the access to information is far easier. And so we can take this a lot further and more efficiently than ever before. But it is truly that individual support that initially con connects you with another patient and you uh, are strengthened by numbers mm -hmm. uh, and empowered to know that if someone else could do it, I could do it. Peggy, uh, do you mind sharing, um, do you remember the interleukin when people in your family say that, oh, well, let me preface this. Do you, when you said that it was grueling, um, it triggered uh, for me uh, a question that, can you elaborate for those of us who are listening that haven't gone through this um, and what your family meant by saying they didn't even, you know, it, for us, I yeah. haven't gone through that. Well, it, um, first of all, I think there's, there is a reputation as such that this is a grueling, some would say gruesome. Some doctors have said you couldn't have advised other patients, or you couldn't possibly get through this unless you were the equivalent of an Olympic athlete, which was wrong. I mean, when I had to do lung tests and my lungs, despite the metastases, and there were hundreds of them, never counted because there were too many, uh, they were strong enough despite being uh, you know, not at all athletic. I had to find a pair of tennis shoes so I could do a treadmill test. So my carrying groceries and kids up and down a set of stairs didn't turn me into an athlete. But so that was the first thing is to, for me to, as I researched to uh, manage these, the misinformation that existed. I had a lot of good information from my hospital, which is UCLA at the time. But um, I could not remember very much. I think that of the hospital, it's a hospital treatment. You're in the hospital theoretically five days, home for about nine, think of a you know, work week and then week off and back to work. A period of time for a rest period, which should then be capped by a CT to see how we're doing. And if there is either stability or shrinkage, mm -hmm. you know, you've slowed things down and it's worthwhile to go into week three and then week four. And that's the total week four, it's four weeks. Yeah, four weeks is, is typical. There are those, and it varies. Okay. But uh, for me, after the first dose, which is given by IV, I don't remember one thing except uh, an emotionally strong thing. My older daughters brought the son in to see me as he was going away. They figured out, and I don't know how that this time of day on the near the end would be okay for them to let the son see me as sick as I was. I remember him. He's, you know, dragged in carrying some flowers for me. And that's about all I remember of that week. My I got home by, you know, osmosis, it seemed was took me three or four days to really come to at my house, wondered where all the flowers and balloons came from, didn't remember anybody visiting me. And then I realized, oh, I've missed a week plus, and this must have been a pretty tough treatment. Is that typical, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, the reality is you want to rev up your immune system. So I was reminded of old stories of people having cholera and uh, surviving. Sure everybody's worrying to death. And the next treatment that I was to go into the following week, I could barely walk through the door. I was so scared, apprehensive, feeling absolutely out of control. I had, if I couldn't even say what had happened to me the week before, how could I walk in and take more of that? And I did a little detour and I probably got pushed in by one of those many children, but uh, another week, tough week. I don't think I had any single memories of that week. And about three weeks, three and a half weeks later, I had my CAT scan. By that time, I'd learned how to get those reports within 24 hours. Sure. Somebody drove me to pick it up. I read it and 
the phrase that will always be in my head is significant shrinkage of the largest lung mets. So, yeah. um, so the largest were just over a centimeter and a half, you know, maybe like three quarters of an inch, they'd shrunk. And that was all I need to, to hear. Something good was happening. And then that third week, I just practically ran in the door. Give me more. Let me see what I can do. And, and yet, after the treatment was over, plus six weeks, another scan, I still had many, many mets in my lungs, but there were fewer. And it was, however, five months after that last dose before I was pronounced cured, mm -hmm. as it were. And I, again, knew enough learning as you go that I was not cured. And the doctor said, well, really, I'm going to call you cured because I don't get to use that answer, or use that very often. But then I get handed the prescription slip, like a probation slip, come back three more months with another CT. And that's how I always felt like I was on probation three months and three months and three months. I think we can all agree to that, right, Richie and Megan? Like it's kind of par for the course that we have that that's part of it that's part of yeah. healing that's part of the journey peggy i want to say thank you for sharing that because um what you're what you're sharing is gru is very gruesome it's very detailed and i don't, hope you didn't have to relive it too no. much but it's Actually. really great for others to listen to to what you went through for what all of us went through with megan richie yeah. myself and oh. and i have the the you know the fabulous benefit of being alive and well and healthy and not taking any treatment and so it was, it, it was kind of a moral dilemma for me when I realized I was well, was going to be well for at least a few more years. I thought, do I dare go in front of the world, i.e. the kidney cancer world and say that I'm doing well? When so many, I mean, I've lost friends. There are others who are struggling, people whose families were so devastated. And I thought, how can I step forward and say, I'm okay? Mm -hmm. I'm fine. I, I got the golden ring and, and realized that that was, it's not, um, I had to remind myself that I'm a, you know, a school teacher and a mom, you're supposed to lead by example. But part two is that this is not a game in which there's only a limited number of winners. There's a way to create the research and the information and share the information. So, you know, you're getting somebody like, uh, again, with the RMC, getting that patient quickly to somebody like Dr. Tanier at uh, Indy yeah. Anderson and someone who will pick up the phone and reach him if they can't reach him uh, directly at, at the hospital. This is, this is what we can do and need to do. So I wanted to kind of group us all in on the next kind of phase here that well, let me give a little bit about myself. I myself am a, a stage three kidney cancer survivor in, in progress. Um, I was incidentally, just like Megan, uh, went in for completely different. Uh, I actually thought I had a UTI. I wasn't feeling quite right. And I went to the ER and um, I pushed, I remember pushing a little bit. I, I never had a UTI in my life and I pushed and I, I said, uh, do you mind doing a little bit more than just giving me this bottle of antibiotics? I don't know why. Maybe it's that, like Megan's talking about, that gut feeling that like, this, this just doesn't sit quite right. And he did. He did an ultrasound and Peggy, he did the very same thing. He turned the screen and said, you know what? I think you need to do a CAT scan too. And at that moment, I thought, uh-oh. Yeah, well. Yeah. And there was an 8.8 .8 centimeter mass. And not 10 days later, here I am getting it cut out, getting a total nephrectomy, left kidney. And just like Richie was saying, a week, you have to wait a week for that biopsy. And uh, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Everyone knows. We all know we've all been through this. And um, I had, uh, what was it? Stage three, P1, stage three, uh, kidney cancer, uh, chromophobe. And uh, come back in three months, get your CAT scan, just go live. And I wanted to share uh, and my story and with you guys, if you can kind of think while I'm sharing mine, is there a certain kind of takeaway you want to share with people today, what you've learned? It, it's either mentally, like we were talking about being your own advocate, Megan was saying, hey, you know what, I want you guys 
from my story to hear this. For me, what my what I learned a lot was mental. It was really, really difficult to keep my anxiety in check. I was um, struggling with a lot of intrusive thoughts, a lot of uh, if I don't live, if this, I have two young children, uh, my husband, I love dearly, my, all these uh, very, very difficult thoughts. I think all of us have gone through those thoughts, dealing with cancer and how to keep them in check. And I was struggling for a very long time. And I've got to say, kidney cancer's taught me, it's given me a bit of a gift. I know that sounds strange, <laughs> but, but it has. Um, I was, I forced, it was a, it, it came to me begrudgingly <laughs> that um, I was fighting, I was fighting those thoughts instead of learning not to react to those thoughts and not to react to them and letting them flow through that I wasn't going to stop them. I wasn't going to stop that anxiety and that the absence of fear it's not what you're looking for. It's that you're pushing through despite the fear. And for me, I learned a lot about being mindful in that. And that if I share that with anyone that's out there, if it resonates, for me, what I've learned was the ability slowly, it's work in progress, even on the daily when we have stress, when I have scan anxiety, when I have a scan coming up, when whatever's it, 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 it goes through all aspects of life that I've learned to realize that it's, I shouldn't be fighting this, trying like, no, I don't want those thoughts in my head. I don't want that. I'm trying to get rid of that when in actuality, it's, it's not that. It's almost like I do it like a, I think of the, uh, the ticker on the stock exchange. I don't know if you can get the, the, the metaphor, but I'm, I see these thoughts, I hear them, but I'm going to sit with them. And they're just scanning through, but I'm not going to react. And today I'm feeling nervous. Today I'm feeling anxious. And that's okay. Take some breaths, like Richie. Yeah. And, and learn that this is part of life. And some days we have more stress than others. And that it is absolutely normal. I'm not some crazy person. Well, maybe to my kids. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that it's part of life, it's part of stress and learning that you have cancer is, is um, it's one of the top, you know, most difficult things we all go through. And um, keeping that in mind that try to not fight the thoughts that they come in, but not to react. And for me, if I can share that little bit of knowledge of what I've learned, um, hopefully you guys can do the same. And I kind of want to go through everybody. I mean, you've given already what you've learned through kidney cancer, but if you can elaborate more so now that we've gotten to know each other and now that we've all introduced each other, what do you want if someone's here listening that they're an advocate, they're a parent, they're like Richie, Peggy, they're Megan, we've all had different aspects, different roles in this journey what we've taken back that you want to share today. Is there something, is anybody kind of resonating that they want to share? Megan, do you have something that you'd like to? Sure. And, um, you know, you brought up anxiety. That That is um, a, a real part of it that I, I didn't realize at the time how much it was going to affect me. Um, I had mentioned earlier, I had some complications. I had three separate pseudoaneurysms uh, subsequently to my surgery. And after the third treatment by an interventional radiologist. Uh, I went home and that weekend, I woke up in the middle of the night. I couldn't breathe. I didn't know where I was. I felt really dizzy and shaky. And I kind of just laid there and it was the middle of the night. And the next morning I said, you know, I think I, I need to go to the hospital. And so I called the facility and they said, okay, if you can safely get here, get here, it could be your blood pressure. So I go in um, and I'm, you know, under observation for the day. They run a series of tests. Uh, they do a CT scan. Um, and at the end of the day, the, the doctor comes in and he says, you know, every, your blood work looks great. Everything looks fine. I think it's just anxiety. And I remember thinking anxiety. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sleeping in my bed at night. How can I be anxious? I feel like there's something wrong. And he said, you just need to, to go home and, and just relax. And so that was a, a real wake up call for me, how much um, 
you know, anxiety can impact you physically. Go home, relax. Just go. <laughs> and 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 you know, it's it's not it is not easy, and it it is something that I have to work at daily to to control any kind of anxious feelings I might have. And you know, I mentioned my cancer was found um, during having fertility issues, and I'm actually I'm due to have a baby boy um, this March. It'll be, I'm due the same week that I had my cancer surgery two years ago. So it's a and it's a very circle of life kind of um, interesting story. Um, but being pregnant, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of physical side effects of it. And that anxiety has returned in, in a weird way that, um, you know, and I, I, I think back to what kind of got me through the, the cancer anxiety and that's stoicism and, and in particular Epictetus and kind of being aware of what is and, and what is not in your control. And, you know, with cancer, getting the type of cancer you're diagnosed with, you know, that's not in your control, but how you handle, you know, your journey going forward, you know, as long as you're equipped, equipping yourself with the right information, you know, that is in your control and, and that can be very empowering. And so I just remind myself of that daily that there are a lot of things happening to my body right now that are outside of my control. And that gives me a lot of anxiety and it brings back a lot of those fears of uncertainty with, with a cancer diagnosis. Um, but, you know, just, I kind of just try to get through it daily. And, and sometimes it can be breathing exercises or, you know, having your mind go to a relaxing place, whether it's the, the beach or the mountains. And, and you just, it, it, is, it is something, like I said, you have to work on, on daily, but just remember there are certain things that are in your control and, and outside of your control and, and learning to, to deal with those that are outside of your control is, is really important. Megan, that is excellent point thank you so much for sharing that and that what you've gone through and what you've learned because that's an absolute in this process that let go what you can't control and uh just deal with what you can and control the things you can control and it sounds it sounds so simplistic but it's really not and it's a it's a really it's a skill we do it every day right and thank you because that's a that's a great thing for for people listening that that is a go to uh, especially so thank you Megan thank you so much Richie Peggy did you want to add to that because I know we also have some questions so did you want to add to um thank you Megan yeah I I think what is was important to me and I see with some other people and not always uh, that they really need information and that was. Uh, again, where there was no control, where it's this big black unknown, just to, for me, it was at least to have the ability to talk about it. I was sort of amazed when I was told I had clear cell kidney cancer. Maybe I'd been told that before, but I couldn't remember. But when I could finally start gathering that information, someone organizing it around, of course, good old me first, and then to expand beyond that, that was, that gave me control in my life. And, and, you know, I still, after all these years, if, if I sneeze, if I get kind of a cold or something's going on, I think, oh my gosh, you know, the lung mats are back. Goes the wheel. I, I could be, you know, under the bed cleaning dust bunnies. And if I sneeze, it's not the dust bunnies, it's the cancer. So, you know, you have to somewhat, you know, take, I have to take it out and look at it. Yeah, and I think would. it's really easy to be hyper, become hyper aware and hypersensitive. And I think everybody in the world can relate to that, especially in the COVID times where mm -hmm. that first cold or that first flu that we get, people are going to think, do I have COVID? I mean, that's just, there is paranoia. Everybody is paranoid. The two Cs, COVID, cancer, exactly. And in fact, to that end, and because we have this audience in front of us, uh, you know, the statistics, again, typically we would have expected to have 74,000 kidney and renal pelvis diagnosis in, let's say, 19, uh, or 2020 and 2021. Well, the diagnosis numbers are down low, which means the coming year, we will have many more diagnoses and they will be a year later, some of them with dreadful consequences. And so despite this paranoia, you know, urge your friends, even those who think they're just fine and healthy, 
to get in and to respond to those other health challenges we have. Uh, and again, push for an earlier diagnosis. And by the way, an x-ray isn't going to do it. Yeah. If you have something on your kidney, the doctor says, well, it's x-ray your lungs. That's not enough. It's a CAT scan you need. And the ultrasound would be a great quick start. But, uh, and, and, I, and I didn't know that. <laughs> Now I do. Yeah, right. Well, that's it. We live. It's a journey and we learn. And so Peggy, thank you. Yes, information, gather a lot of it, get what you can. Uh, because when you do get diagnosed, we don't, uh, we're blinded. We're, yeah, exactly. We, we don't know. I mean, how many of us are in the field to begin with? And then we find out we have it and then we're knowledgeable. It's truly work in progress. So thank you. Yes, that's true. And a great, great point. Richie, did you have one that you yes, I just wanted to say one thing is do not let cancer diagnosis marginalize you. Stay positive and do not give up. That's uh what do you do then? Here, this is a this is something maybe someone would be asking. Staying hopeful is so difficult when you get those terrible thoughts or those intrusive thoughts. What do you suggest they do? Just kick them to the curb or like what it that's a that's tough you know during that time you have to look at it there there are two peaks to a valley and even when you're in that valley you can find something positive mm -hmm. and you can only go up so always try to find something positive regardless of what you're going through absolutely you're right it's a choice you can look it's at the or down at the valley which one are you going to do Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so here, ladies, we have um, a couple questions that I'm going to put my old glasses on here and see. Uh, please feel free, whoever wants to address these. Um, here's one. Hearing a lot about CAT scans or CT scans, how do you balance the risks of scan radiation versus needed monitoring? Please. Well, first of all, the, the risk that you have because of the cancer you have had or are treating right now is so far much greater than the risk of some radiation from a CAT scan. Uh, and, and the CAT scans properly given and uh, with newer equipment, frankly, are less, uh, less dangerous, but our real risk is not radiation in build up that happens you know 20 and 30 years from now our our real risk is the ongoing cancer and the risk of recurrence so that's the Again, important I hear, thing i see you nodding your head did you want to add to that yeah megan may have a different situation with the pregnancy you know no and i i agree with this and i actually just kind of went through this um with my doctors i had my six month scan in july before i knew i was pregnant and, um, you know, they obviously administer a pregnancy test before you have your scan, but it, it came up negative. Um, but I was pregnant at the time. And I was, you know, in the earlier weeks of the pregnancy, I had a lot of concern about exposure to radiation and the use of contrast. Um, but, you know, it was explained to me that the, the, the amount of radiation that is used in the CT machine, it, it should be a non-issue, at least that early in a pregnancy. Um, Concur as well with Peggy that this is important. This is something that that even though you may have the fear of the radiation, that the cancer and the need for diagnosis and looking in is, is more important. Well, I, I would say that uh, if you have any real issues with the CAT scans, you could also discuss if an MRI is appropriate just because that has sure. apparently sure. carries less radiation. I could be corrected on any of this, by the way. And, well, and I would say reach out also to, we've heard mention of smartpatients.com. There's a broad range of uh, people who are knowledgeable and people who are gaining knowledge from one another and sharing that information and that which they get from their doctors. And sometimes that's the midnight email you make. Well, you know, we have another question. And it's from the audience, so I will read this out. And again, please, anyone who uh, feels who wants to answer, while never having any symptoms, my 10 centimeter tumor caught me by complete surprise. I'm now encouraging my son and daughter to consider getting screened when reaching a certain age or feeling an unusual pain. 
am I overdoing my concern to my kids? Richie, you had a son with this. How do you feel about that? I agree. She should um, have her child tested and don't feel like she's overreacting. Um, since kidney cancer is normally asymptomatic until it's full blown, it's always good to even have your urine checked annually to see if there's any blood in your urine, uh, which is usually the main side effect, uh, first side effect of uh, kidney cancer. So I would say absolutely not. You are the advocate for your child and by all means do what you need to do to take care of your child. Mm -hmm. And I would but, also just I would agree that I have grown children and I thought, you know, when they turn 40, that's what I will do is make them or get them a CAT scan. And yet now I think perhaps improved ultrasound might be the least worrisome approach, but something also to recognize, at least with Richie's son and Richie as a carrier of the sickle cell trait, uh, is it, you know, is there was a recognition of much more kind of family history of cancers that were not thought to be associated with kidney cancer. Kidney cancer wasn't thought to be frequently inherited risk situation. And that has changed. The more knowledgeable they come about kidney cancers in general, there's a thought that many, many more are part of one's family history risk, not necessarily likely to get, but a, an increased risk. So, you know, don't, don't hesitate to be cautious. Megan, but please. not saying. No, I, I was just going to, to add what, what Peggy mentioned. Um, you know, I, I was told I think 80% of cancers are sporadic. Um, and but there is a familial history there. So um, exploring, depending on the type of cancer she had, I think exploring genetic testing for herself and having her, her children um, look into that as well, that, that might be helpful information. I agree with that. I did some genetic testing for my daughters as well, being that both Megan and Richie, well, you had clear cell, but with these uh, unusual forms of kidney cancer, um, I did those as well. That's a very um, important topic as well, genetic testing for those who have, uh, who want to know. I mean, there's, there's so many different types that can be, that can be associated with, as Richie knows. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, yeah, that's another important point. I think, uh, did you guys uh, have any other points of topic that you wanted to share? Because I think it's time for us to wrap it up. I also want to say um, we have here at the KCA, it's called um, Care to Share, and we do it once a month. If um, you guys are familiar with it, right? Yeah. Where we get, <laughs> Peggy, yeah. <laughs> Where we actually all, anyone, you know, affected with kidney cancer, anyone, any parents, anybody in any way who just wants to join and listen and talk, we just sit there and share. It's not a medical forum. We don't discuss medical diagnoses or anything like that, but we do share our uh, feelings, our thoughts, whatever is going on regarding kidney cancer at the time. It's an open platform, an open forum to just communicate and share. And I, I don't know, were you guys, did you feel, especially, I mean, Richie, you were, this was 2000, and Peggy, 2004, 2011, it's come a long way. Do you agree? I know we oh, have absolutely. a lot more to go. We have a lot more to go, but. We've come a long way. Yeah, and, and I would say, when I talk about getting educated, people are naturally going to go to Dr. Google, however you want to look at it. And I think the first thing you do is to look at the date of the report you're reading. And I had a purging of my own files that, damn it, I'm going to throw away everything that is wrong because so much has changed during the time period. So, and I keep others, they're over and I have it labeled ancient history <laughs> because <laughs> it has history. improved so dramatically. And I don't want someone to pick up something that I read in 2005, let's say, and say, oh, you know, I'm in deep doo-doo here. It is, there is so much more information and new information is valuable. And now I'm thinking, do I throw away things that were six years old? Not yet, but that has changed in the past five years. And the information we get is usually about five years old in the major, um, information forums because it takes that long to properly gather huge databases 
and they're already out of date by the time they're, you know, online. So, cautious. well, Peggy, Peggy, I definitely hope that we can eventually have everybody with kidney cancer take those medical records and throw them in the trash because the cure can happen and we don't need them anymore. So that would be the ultimate goal is that we could all ignore every single record that's there and they're all out of date because it doesn't matter. Um, but I want to thank you all for giving your perspectives today um, and Salima for sort of moderating this session. I know people out there want to you know, connect with people more. We've mentioned some of those resources, but I definitely want to thank you guys. Um, and I'm going to sort of wrap it up and let us know where we can go from here. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you.